Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. It is, to say the very least, a rather fraught time for democracy around the world. Authoritarians are gaining popularity and even power in countries often thought to be some of the world's most safest democracies. The results of elections, the fairness of elections, are questioned more and more often by the losing party, so much so that the simple and routine transfer of power in the United Kingdom recently was hailed as a victory. Those circumstances create a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, which makes more would-be dictators more likely to cling to power no matter what. Now to the growing crisis in Venezuela. Thousands taking to the streets to protest the widely disputed re-election of President Nicolas Maduro. The U.S. and several other countries now recognizing the opposition leader as the winner and calling for negotiations to ensure a peaceful transfer of power. What happens now in Venezuela, where a political standoff is taking place with the eyes of the world watching? How delicate is the situation there? How tense? How far? Will Maduro go to hold on to power? And what can the rest of the world do if he simply refuses to budge? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Mia Dahl is a freelance reporter normally based in Mexico City. She is currently in the Venezuelan capital, Caracas, which uh, explains something if you hear a little noise outside the window. Hello, Mia. Hi, Jordan. Thanks so much for joining us to walk us through this, something I think uh, a lot of Canadian listeners haven't had the chance to really delve into, but uh, obviously an urgent story right now. Definitely. <laughs> Why don't you start there, in fact? Um, just bring our listeners up to date, especially those who haven't uh, been following international politics closely. Who was Venezuela's July 28th election in between? Just give us the context around the vote before we get to everything that's happened since then. Yeah, for sure. So on Sunday, July 28th, uh, Venezuelans uh, went to the polls to choose between mainly two candidates. Uh, so on, on one side, there was a sitting president, Nicolas Maduro, uh, who's a leader of Venezuela's socialist party. He's been in power for about 11 years now. And he's this uh, authoritarian leader who has become uh, more and more radical over time. So he was on one side. Then on the other side, we had Edmundo González Urrutia, quite an unusual candidate. He's this uh, 74-year-old retired diplomat that few Venezuelans or anyone uh, knew a few uh, months ago. And he was chosen by another candidate, the, the opposition leader here in Venezuela, uh, Maria Corina Machal, a former lawmaker who has become wildly popular. She uh, won the primary elections for the opposition in October last year with about 93% of the votes. Uh, she's been incredibly popular, but she has been barred from running. So she had to choose another candidate, uh, Corina Lloris, who was this um, academic uh, figure who then also got barred uh, by the government from running. And then we now stand with Edmundo Gonzalez, who's sort of the substitute to the substitute, huh. but either way gained enormous popularity within a few months, simply because of the fact that He's the candidate that Ma Maria Corina Machal chose, um, and he's the candidate who represents an alternative to Nicolás Maduro, a democratic alternative after 11 years of, of authoritarian rule. Before I ask about the vote itself, uh, how did the previous two candidates get banned? Did the government even offer any kind of explanation for what happened, or was it just a straight authoritarian? Yeah, so Maria Corina Machal has a very long history in, in Venezuelan politics. She's pretty much always been critical of this government and uh, also the predecessor of this president, Hugo Chavez, who was very much the figure who created the ideology that the current president is, is basing his politics and rule on. 
she's always been critical. And of course, in, in return, this government has always been critical of her as well. But that has sort of intensified in recent years, especially as Maria Corina Machado was sort of seen as this outsider by a lot of people. She was seen as radical, right-wing candidate. But she has sort of moderated a bit, but also maybe more importantly, the Venezuelans and and, and their opinions uh, have changed as well. So she's gained enormous support. Um, the government still doesn't like her. And that's how uh, they started putting up these charges against her. So it actually started with them saying that uh, she had committed corruption, fiscal fraud for not correctly reporting some meals as a lawmaker, uh, which seemed sort of, uh, you know, like a ridiculous charge. Uh, Maria Corina Matao said she never even had those meals. But still, uh, the government has very much man- maintained that she's corrupt. Uh, they've maintained charges and even intensified them now after the election is uh, threatening her with arrest orders. So all of that is to say that the election came down to basically Maduro versus Gonzalez. And what were the results of the vote? And uh, I guess there's no other way to put this. Uh, How certain are we that we know the correct results? Yeah, that's a great question, because today we actually stand with two results in in Venezuela. And we also have two candidates who both say they won this election. So on one hand, what happened on election night is that Venezuela's national election authorities, uh, CNE, published uh, a result. They said uh, that with most of the votes counted, Nicolás Maduro, the sitting president, had won won the vote with 51% of the votes versus 44% for um, Edmundo González. But they provided no proof of where that vote came from. Hmm. And unlike in previous years where you would expect the election authority to publish the result by a a voting station uh, basis, this time that didn't happen. And that still hasn't happened despite pressure from both within Venezuela, but also from governments abroad to publish those results. So that's on one side. But then we actually stand with a parallel result right now, because when the election authorities here in Venezuela announced the result uh, early in the uh, Monday morning, Shortly after Maria Corina Machao and Edmundo González stood up and said, no, we won these elections. And they did that based on some tallies, which are these like uh, paper sheets that are printed from the voting machines, uh, which showed that collecting 80 percent of those uh, tallies, uh, Edmundo González had won by a wide margin. Uh, Right now, they've collected 81 percent of the tallies that shows that he won by 67% of the vote versus 30% for Nicolás Maduro. That's a change uh, of like 7 million versus 3 million votes, roughly. And that was backed up by a lot of data that we've seen before the vote. But because before the vote, we already saw some exit polls um, confirming a similar margin to uh, González. We saw, um, <laughs> at, I was here in the streets talking to people. It was quite frankly hard to find anyone who said they <laughs> supported Maduro. So there's a lot of doubt because on one hand you have uh, the election authority backed by supporters of uh, of the sitting uh, authoritarian president. And on the other hand, you have these like uh, tallies that the opposition has gathered through their own uh, volunteers on the ground. There's about one million citizens that have been mobilized to sort of defend the vote and document the process and then they show something quite uh, quite drastically different. And so after these two competing results were released, uh, we get to, I think, the pictures that most people listening to this program have seen. Um, what did Maduro do when it became clear that he likely lost this election? And how did Venezuelans respond to the competing results? So actually, election day here in Venezuela was a bit surprising because in many ways it was calmer than people had expected. And now there's this, uh, you know, talk about how at that point it didn't really make sense to try to alter the vote by uh, repressing voters in the ways that we've previously seen it here in Venezuela. But the way that what happened was essentially that in the evening, 
of the election, uh, usually the national election authority would come with, out with a result about 10 or 11 p.m. That didn't happen. They sort of delayed and then they just came out with this very surprising uh, result of a 51% uh, victory to Duma Duro. So it just seems like uh, what many people here call a mega fraud. He just, uh, the elect uh, election authority, uh, simply just announced a number without having any sort of backing for it. And and the way people have responded to that was, you know, first of all, the opposition came out quite fast after that uh, to contest that result uh, and to proclaim that Gonzalez had won the vote based on these tallies that they had very carefully collected. Um, but then Venezuelans were also furious, you know. So mm -hmm. you saw uh, the day after people started taking to the streets in a way that we haven't really seen before, Venezuela is quite used to protests. They've had massive protests in 2014, 2017, again in 2019. But what we saw this time was sort of different because whereas previous protests had been you know, characterized more by this very politically engaged middle class sort of voter. This time it was people from the barrios, as they say here, the slum areas uh, who came down. They come from areas that have traditionally been strongholds of this government. Uh, many of them poor people who have very little left and they're disappointing, uh, disappointed in this socialist government that some of them supported uh, a few years or even months ago. Um, and now they require a change. Actually, polls uh, ahead of the election show that uh, around 75% of Venezuelans wanted a change. So some of these people who've never really been in the streets before mobilized through spontaneous protests, uh, unlike before where the political leadership had sort of told people to go out in the streets. This time, protests just erupted uh, spontaneously. People tore down monuments of the of the founder of the government's movement, Hugo Chavez, and the ones who didn't uh, protest violently stayed at home doing what what people call here casserolas, where they bang pots and pans to make noise and manifest that they were not agreeing with the result that had been published. You've been there for the past several days. What has been the atmosphere at those protests and, and what has the government done in response? Yeah, so I would say in the first days after the uh, the results came out, it was chaotic. There was a lot of protesting, a lot of noise in the streets, several killings, lots of detainments. But then after a few days, it was like the streets were starting to empty. And that happened for a couple of reasons. Well, the opposition leadership didn't really encourage people to, to go out. So it, it started this new phase of people waiting for the opposition leadership to say what to do. Uh, there was no call for protests as such. And then, you know, the government made this massive crackdown on protests, which, which got people, quite frankly, scared here. Hmm. Uh, so what we saw in the first days after the elections was blatant shootings in the center of Caracas, where you have these colectivos, which are paramilitary groups that uh, support the government. And when... The armed forces uh, of the government didn't maybe, uh, it, it didn't in all cases directly confront the protesters. The colectivos very much did. So they sort of served as this extra arm for the government to crack down on protesters. Then what we've seen from there is uh, what has now been described as the biggest uh, crackdown done by the Maduro government ever. He says himself that he has arrested about 2,000 people, he accuses them of being part of a coup d'etat. And that means that people now are quite uh, scared to go out. In the aftermath of the protests and the crackdown, what has the international community said about the results of this election? Has anyone pledge to do anything about it. I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, we discuss all the time that democracy is under threat around the world. And uh, and here we are. So what's the reaction been uh, from peer nations? So I think the reaction has been sort of mixed uh, and divided into sort of two or three main blocks. Uh, so there's one block of countries that 
uh, immediately celebrated Nicolas Maduro's victory. Those countries are hardcore allies of this government, uh, most of them authoritarian regimes themselves. So we saw countries like uh, Russia, China, Cuba, Iran, celebrating the results of, uh, of the sitting president. Then we had another block of countries uh, saying, no, we support the opposition candidate Gonzalez. Some have already recognized him as the uh, president elect of the country. And then we had like a third block, which is the bigger block of countries uh, that said, these results just cannot be verified. We need to see more proof. We need to have a transparent uh, result. And they asked for um, some of them for impartial verification of the results. So that's where we stand right now with about a bit more than 20 countries requiring um, the government to release the detailed voting counts to be able to verify the results. I'm going to ask you about Canada specifically. What has our government said or asked for in all of this? Yeah, so Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Melanie Jolie, came out and said that they don't see any credible evidence that the results claimed by the, claimed by the Maduro authorities of this election uh, actually reflect the will of the Venezuelan people. Uh, so she's asked the government of Venezuela to publish detailed results of the voting count. At the same time, she condemned human rights violations. She asked for Venezuela to release political pr uh, prisoners and people who have been arbitrarily detained in this process. And she called for a peaceful process of transition in which she said, Canada would very much be there to accompany any negotiations. Uh, so they very strongly condemned the results of the Maduro government, but without actually mentioning the name of Edmundo Gonzalez. So this is not a recognition of him as a president-elect, which stands in, in stark contra uh, contrast to the U.S. response to this, because the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, was quite quick at coming out to say, that Edmundo Gonzalez has won this election. He has not called him the president-elect, but he did say that Edmundo Gonzalez had an overwhelming victory um, at Sunday's election. So what does uh, Maduro do uh, with that from the international community? Uh, is he just going to cling to power? From this point, what happens now? Yeah, so there's a couple of different scenarios there. Uh, on one hand, it's possible, uh, many say likely, that Nicolas Maduro will try to cling on to power uh, and just make this uh, what will look more like a Nicaragua-style dictatorship with continued harsh crackdowns and any sort of dissent. But there's also another way, another scenario, where we see a full democratic transition with Edmundo González as the leader but in between there, there's a lot of different options. Uh, some are talking about an annulment of the results uh, to call for new elections. It's not an option that the uh, people here are excited about. Um, the opposition says they already have the proof that they won and see no reasons to do that. Then there are other options uh, as uh, probably the most likely will be some sort of internal fracture within the government uh, that could lead to to a change uh, that can put even further pressure on negotiations that are happening right now for a democratic uh, transition. And any kind of uh, transition is likely to involve, you know, guarantees for the current government uh, in order for them to give up power. So we're talking here about a potential amnesty, potential power sharing agreements uh, to make any democratic transition work. In the meantime, as... Uh, we wait for that to play out. How delicate is the situation there? You mentioned more than 2,000 people uh, detained. You know, how, how tense is it? And uh, do we know uh, if uh, Gonzalez and uh, the rest of the opposition would consider themselves safe at the moment? So the situation is definitely very uh, tense right now. The opposition leadership uh, is more or less in hiding. They're facing arrest orders, threats. There's been attempts to, to detain or even kidnap uh, parts of the opposition leadership. So they're under a lot of pressure 
but the population is also under a lot of pressure. Um, the government has, you know, intensified intimidation campaigns and crackdowns. Uh, so they send out messages saying that, you know, anyone who is part of this, what they call a uh, coup d'etat, uh, will face consequences. They've done massive detentions. Uh, they even started these social media channels for regular citizens to try to report on each other, uh, reporting any sort of dissent and suspicious activity. So it's created this atmosphere where people are afraid of joining protests, people are afraid of even posting on their social media or even their private conversations because uh, sometimes uh, militaries now stop people on the street to revise their phones from WhatsApp messages and photos and so on. So this is really intensified and there's definitely uh, this atmosphere of uh, fear and cautiousness, but hope is not lost. Last question then, in the bigger picture, as I mentioned, you know, in places uh, from Bangladesh to Russia to Turkey to even the United States right now, there's a lot of rhetoric about how uh, democracy uh, can be under attack. How important is what happens in Venezuela now uh, to the next stage of democracy around the world? Yeah, I would say all eyes are on Venezuela right now. Um, there's, first of all, some quite important lessons from what has happened in Venezuela over the last weeks and months. Um, and I think something particularly surprising is how well organized the opposition has been in responding to this. And they really set an example that I think uh, we'll see oppositions in authoritarian countries all over the world will probably try to follow in the future because they did the, they set up this massive apparatus of citizen uh, volunteers who helped them document the election process, who collected these tallies. It's been uh, quite an innovative response to some of the obstacles imposed by the government. So I think we'll see that uh, no matter what happens from here, that has set an example that uh, oppositions all over the world might look towards. Of course, uh, this will have wider implications for the region in terms of migration. Uh, there's already about 8 million Venezuelans who have fled this government. It can also have uh, implications in terms of security because Venezuela has been exporting their transnational crime groups to other countries in the region. It has implications in terms of energy security as right now um, sanctions have sort of been on and off on Venezuela and energy security is obviously a uh, Hugely important to this part of the world amidst war in Russia uh, and Ukraine, as well as in the Middle East. And then it might have implications for global alliances, uh, pro or anti-democracy. We see that uh, the Venezuelan government works not alone, but in an alliance of authoritarian countries with uh, countries like Russia, Cuba, Iran, that support each other. So uh, a win or a loose situation here in Venezuela will also be seen as a winner or loose situation in those countries. Mia, thank you so much for explaining this to us and thank you for all your reporting uh, on the topic and stay safe down there. Thank you, Jordan. Mia Dull reporting from Caracas, Venezuela. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always send us your thoughts, your ideas for stories, your feedback on this episode or any other by writing to us at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us and leaving us a voicemail. And if you want us to play the voicemail on our feedback episodes, you've got to tell us we have your permission. That phone number is 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in every single podcast player and, of course is on your smart speaker, just ask it to play The Big Story Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.